MMTLP. That ticker symbol alone can strike fear into the hearts of probably about a dozen investors. MMTLP is one of those securities that make you ask more questions and give you less answers. As a child, I was one of those kids who would always try to guess their Christmas presents, to which my parents would always be upset about. Well, today, hopefully we can answer some questions, or at least shed some light on some questions. Maybe eventually this will yield some answers. Are these answers? I'll let you decide. MMTLP. When exactly did it start trading? On the 6th, there was like no info. I couldn't find anything in terms of, but on the 7th, this thing starts trading. But I didn't see any electronic bid ask. Presumption on the 8th it is. There's like this day in terms of this changeover where the market makers that we worked through were accepting orders, but there was somewhere you could ship these. So it seems at first MMTLP was trading from market maker to market maker. There was a day where it didn't trade and then trading resumed, but now it was electronic. But the first day there was nothing electronic straight to the Ethereum as that audio described where there was about a 20 minute delay. Do you recall when MMTLP was trading, how there was that release saying that it then was going through this other place and it was approved to trade on the open market. Do you remember that? Like there was this release on the OTC that said, oh, MMTLP is now backed by blah, 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 so-and-so. And it's trading. I think that's when the security was able to trade again. If you want to trade these, good luck. But, you know, you need to deal with consequences. And then legislation seemingly limited this. The audio also suggests about this legislation, and it prevented that. Hmm. What legislation are they talking about? This 15C2 that kept preaching on, he resorted back to this 15C2. So I assume that the 15C2 indicates that market makers can't do what they're doing currently legislation that prevents a lot of things from being quoted or whatnot. There's just higher standards to trade on that NASDAQ or New York. So if they don't, they're exchanging some, usually some of these crackdowns, they do have an electronic market, which looks like what this is now. Now I couldn't find a copy rep or an OTC rep to further claim this. It used to be that, you know, six months ago, you would have plenty of cases where you'd have these stocks that had no electronic market. Basically, you could submit orders Ether. 20 minutes later, they'd go in. You know, you may or may not get something. So six months ago, you could trade this, but now you can't. What's changed in the past six months? Hmm. A lot of our frontline folks, or maybe some of the not-so-tenured folks, you know, you start throwing around that kind of language around and they get nervous. Additionally, they're dealing with these changes with the 152C-11 and like folks are, that's making a lot of our frontline folks nervous because there's some additional due diligence. I get what they were doing with the ruling, but it hasn't been ruled out well. And additionally, possibly it's been a little bit messy. Well, according to this document, there's quite a few restricted securities now which are impacted by 15C2-11. There are many restricted securities. 15C2-11 was went into effect on September 28th of 2021. It restricts the ability of market makers to publish quotations for these securities that trade over the counter. 
And it says they're restricted because of financial disclosures available to regulators and investors. So basically, if the financials aren't disclosed, this cannot trade. If the financials aren't given, this cannot be pre-quoted. How things are traded on the OTC is you have a market maker come up and pre-quote you. He's just going to work with, as you said, some market makers and do some checking in the background. They can pre-quote you on certain securities. Not every security. Do they have to disclose financials? Usually. But MMTLP really didn't have any financials. So, if they didn't have any financials, how were they able to trade? It was a little surprising to see that because I was looking on the OTC website and in order, this firm filed a bunch of documents, a bunch of forms, over the last, the end of September through the start of October, which you may. So seemingly they have some standards which allow them to be pre-quoted. So like the idea that they are now current in their info or you can trade it or there's a common quoting on it makes some sense. So it would seem that MMTLP was filed by market makers during the end of September to before the 152C-11 went into effect on the 28th. They only had a few days to file for this and they had to be quick so that the security could be pre-quoted and traded. Well, how can it be pre-quoted and traded without the company's financial statements? That seems rather odd, doesn't it? Well, let's listen to this audio clip explaining how it's done. So sometimes you get, you end up with these things like warrants or rights are usually pretty confusing for folks, and they're like a product of a corporate action usually. But they're basically the right to buy a stock at a certain price. But then they'll sometimes, they'll start trading. And they'll trade kind of like an option, right? They'll trade based on the future value of the stock. And I don't know if that's what this thing is, but that's what this thing feels like. Something that's kind of like trading, you know? Based on a future value or a future projected payout. So are you telling me that if I have an escrow share and I don't want it, I can go contact a market maker and have them get rid of it for me? And so what you'll sometimes see is that these escrow shares that will be held in a client's account as a place marker for future payments, I feel like maybe one of GM's bankruptcies, they ended up with these. And then what will happen is they'll sit and they'll look like a worthless security in a client's account. And like, we'll have clients that would call us and be like, can you just get these? I'm tired of looking at it. Ugh, I lost so much money. Ugh. And then we'll look into it and be like, oh, well, maybe there's an escrow payment on December 31st. So just like leave it there. Don't forfeit your right to whatever we're recouping. So what investor was sitting around going, uh, looking at the Torchlight Preferred shares in their account? If you look at the market today, Torchlight Preferred shares have held their value. This was pre-trading MMTLP, remember? I'm sure many of you investors have had it where the market was red and the best thing in your account was the Torchlight Preferred shares, which did not lose any value that day. One investor went, uh, can any investor go, uh, or can only some financial institutions go, uh, who went, uh, did anybody go, uh, more questions. And why is 152C-11 making people nervous. Why would people get nervous about this? Okay, the, the company doesn't have anything to disclose. They can't be pre-quoted and thus traded, right? Does this affect escrow shares? Is this a regular share or an escrow share? Because 
the way you just described the preferred, and I haven't researched this myself. I'm going off what you're telling me. The way you just described this preferred share is similar to a, an escrow share. And sometimes you'll see these like, so when you see, look at a company that goes into bankruptcy, right? The common shareholders, they have no entitlement to anything. Correct. They usually don't get anything, but your bondholders and your preferred stockholders have more entitlement, right, than your common holders. So it would seem that MMTLP began to be traded because it looked like an escrow share. What is an escrow share? Let's find out. Escrow shares, by definition, are stocks and shares that are held in an escrow account. Escrow means that the shares are held by a third party until certain conditions have been met to reduce counterpart risk in transactions. Mergers and acquisitions often require shares of the target company to be held in escrow until the deal is finalized. So let me get this straight. MMTLP was originally the Torchlight Preferred Shares, which happened because of a merger. A reverse takeover. The preferred shares went to a third-party escrow account until the dividend was supposed to be paid. But here's the question. What third-party account was this? That's what I want to know. What third-party account was this? Was this Metamaterials account, ASTI? My instinct tells me that something is very suspicious with what's happening, to the point where I called the financial institute that did the transfer, AST Financials, for Metamaterials, and Torchlight. I called to ask them about what this MMTLP is, and they said, I don't know. They said, it, I had no idea. It didn't come from us. Who the hell sent it? It came from the clearinghouse. This letter from Mark states that Metamaterials had nothing to do with it, nor did their bank. When this person called, some people said that, no, we have nothing to do with these shares. Some people said, yes, we do have something to do with these shares. Was AST the third party or was there a different third party involved? Who was this third party? Again, he's in a different portion of our business, more of the back and support type of role, okay? Are they somehow involved in this nefarious activity? To answer these questions, when... It appears that the documents, again, were filed late September, early October, but they were caught right on the cusp of Rule 152C-11, where on the OTC, from whose third party, we don't know. I don't know. What third party? Was this ASTI who held the Meta shares or the Torchlight shares, or was it a different party that held the escrow shares? How? They look like escrow shares. And somebody went, oh, I don't want these sitting around in my account. Hence, they contacted a market maker to try and sell them between another institution. As stated by Mark, somebody didn't want these and they sold them to somebody who was buying them. Thus, a market was created. You can't just go out and buy a preferred share. I couldn't do that. Sure you can. Well, now I can because there's a market for it. Right. You can buy anything that there's a market for. But there, there was no market when I bought this on the other platform. Hmm. Have you ever had like any stocks that have issued like say warrants or rights or had anything that went bankrupt and you ended up with escrow shares? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Yes, there is a market for everything. You can get a market for everything. Can you? Why were these shares created? Did somebody not want these shares in their account? Did they think that they were just a bankruptcy escrow share? Or is there some other ulterior motive? Well, let's look at the big question. Who? Who could have done this? To find out, let's examine some routing reports on one of the first days of trading. 
Trading started on this on October 7th when it was non-electronic. And then it resumed on the 8th. I don't have an answer at this point to why basically this, why basically there was a day lag there to where it was trading non-electronically before electronic resumed. So here's another market maker. Some of your shares executed at, um, let's see, CSPI. I want to see everything on the 7th. And again, this is very specific. So CSTI is Canaccord Genuity. Canaccord Genuity, CSTI. So, and I'm just going to look through a handful more. Those are the only two market makers that I see that your trades were executed through. I know you don't believe me, and that's fine. But I'm just looking. I'm going to scroll through other trades, right? Because I can pull reports for the security for the whole day. CS, who is the other one? GTSM. And that's the one you're already a little nervous about because of who the CEO is. Some RE guy? I haven't gone that deep. And the other one is CSTI, which according to OTC markets, the one that belongs to Canaccord Genuity LLC. So it would appear that two market makers, at least in the beginning, had something to do with this. Those two market makers are GTSM, otherwise known as GTS, and CSTI. I'll spell it for you. CSTI. GTSM stands for Global Trading Systems. CTSI stands for Canaccord Genuity. These are two popular market makers, GTSM and CTSI. GTSM also goes by GTS, by the way, but they're market maker symbol because of market maker M, GTSM. Market makers often have symbols, which they trade under. When you get a routing report from your broker, which you can ask for, by the way, you'll see the symbols of who traded. Maybe that's something we ought to start doing. Maybe we should all start asking for routing reports. I'm sure that will raise some eyebrows when you call your brokerage and ask for routing reports. Hello, how may I get a routing report? And when you ask for your routing report, will you be met with helpfulness? Yeah, sure, no problem. Or will you be met with hostility and questions why you would want such a thing? Because some people don't like it when you start asking questions. They find it rather nefarious. What catches my eye is this one, GTSM. Who is this Ari guy? Global Trading Systems. Global Trading Systems was co-founded by Ari Rubenstein. Or is it Rubenstein? I've always been very terrible with pronunciations. But Ari Rubenstein is one of the co-founders of GTS. He looks rather young. He has very white teeth. If you look at Mr. Rubenstein's credentials, he has quite a list. He's gone before the U.S. House of Financial Services Committee and the SEC. He's testified on key market structure issues, including the importance of publicly listed companies in driving job creations, capital raising, and economic growth. He frequently collaborates with regulators as a member of the financial industry's regulatory, as a member of the financial industry regulatory authority, market surveillance advisory board. Whew, he is on a big advisory board. Did the company led by such an esteemed individual just assume that these were some sort of bankruptcy escrow share or was something else going on? Let's dig a bit deeper. It seems that GTS has been busy creating a f digital asset market called Radkill. Radkill is backed by none other than our dear friend. And although Steve Cohen will be a financial backer in this market, he is not associated with the day-to-day -day operations. They believe, they, as in GTS, believes that digital assets will define the global markets and economy of the future of finance. Well, the cryptocurrency market is now at $2 trillion. 
We're still in the early stages of institutional adaptation. What's going to happen? What will be the future of cryptocurrency once it's infiltrated by institutions? Backed by... an interesting partnership. And you're playing Russian roulette, so you're spinning it, and I got four empty holes. I'm trying to get them filled, is what I'm saying. You ask for a smoking gun? I got two out of the six slots filled. I need the other four. The Who, at least in the beginning, we have two known market makers involved in this, GTSM and CTSI. Let's take a look at a routing report. As you can see here, most of the market was GTSM, but there are a few peppered CTSIs in the mix of this particular routing report. This was in the early trading days of MMTLP. What you can do is gather more knowledge because when you start asking your financial broker for those routing reports, they'll wonder why. It seems that MMTLP began trading because somebody may or may not have gone, uh, and thus a market was created. Some of the market makers include GTSM, Global Trading Solutions, and CTSI, Canaccord Genuity. It was traded because it looked like an escrow share from a bankrupt or merged business. Sometimes people don't want escrow shares. We learned some people want to get them out of their account. Was this an individual with a lot of shares or was this an institution with a lot of shares? Did they really not want these shares? Or was there some other reason why they didn't want these shares all of a sudden? He described it to me as you're buying a piece of paper behind a barn. So I went behind the barn and I bought the same thing that I own on the NYSE. But now I bought it for 65 cents compared to paying for it on the market, on the real market. Not the shady tree. I find this barn analogy rather interesting because if somebody doesn't want the shares, why would you go behind a barn to sell them? It's very interesting. MMTLP is described as going behind the barn to get a piece of paper from somebody. Instead of paying for it on the market full price, you can go behind the barn and pay 62 cents for this. The barn, who was the barn? Legislation 152C-11 is making lots of people nervous. It's making lots of brokerages nervous. Okay, guys, that's it for part five. There will probably be an investigation video part six sometime in the future. As to when, I don't know. I didn't predict this to happen as soon as it did, but I, you know, had the opportunity to take notes from many conversations, which is what you see. The, the text was the notes that I took. Sadly, the audio uh, had to be redacted, and we went by the notes of the conversation. But that's how it is sometimes. Thank you for your patience. This has taken a lot of work for me to do. It's, you know, it was a lot of work for one bird. Hopefully it's a nice Christmas present if you celebrate uh, some form of that during this time of year. I will see you soon. Goodbye.